All right, you guys ready to start our Sunday school this morning? Amen. All right, we'll continue with our evangelism study or look into evangelism, really breaking down to um, um, who does it, how do you do it, and why do we do it, and, and really kind of in a different order, how we do it being really the last thing, so. Uh, but let's go ahead and open with a word of uh, prayer, and then we'll start our start our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity that we have to study your word. Pray that as we as we look into the reality that it is trying to reach the the lost with the truth of the gospel, Father, give us a heart's desire to want to fulfill this teaching, this this instruction that you've given us. Help us to understand that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of sound mind. And we have no reason to fear to share the gospel. And so, Father, I just pray that, that we all be blessed and we all be enlightened, further in our knowledge of your will in our lives. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Evangelism. Last week we, we started speaking about it, really got into um, more of a discussion versus a, a really uh, teaching on it, which, which I like the discussion aspect of it too. Um, and that's, that's really important because again, as I've said to you, um, the, the point of this isn't just to have some, um, you know, boring teaching on evangelism. It's to strengthen each of us as a body, a local body and, and obviously members of the the, the total body of Christ so that we can be out there trying to um, warn people about what's coming if you're not saved and that's ultimately uh, what's important we talked about the fact that you know having a, an understanding that we're to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives that we are to equip the saints and to evangelize the lost but those first two things you know, you don't, you don't um, have to be on earth to do those. Well, there will be no evangelizing the lost once we're in heaven or in the fullness of times, uh, that type of thing. The only time, the only opportunity to evangelize the lost is the here and now. And so the other two we're going to be, we'll be doing in the sense of the, the saints will be fully edified, we'll be exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. But right now here, the, the reason why we have to, the reason why we're still left here more than anything is to to evangelize the lost and so how important that really is and we get comfortable as believers talking about our doctrine and, and we get comfortable maybe arguing with other believers um, but in the end we have to realize that uh, we have to be about sharing the gospel and reaching the lost because of how important that truly is sometimes we don't want to want to get involved with that Sometimes we don't care about that person down the street as much as we care about our own child who's in our house. Uh, and and there's, a, there's an understanding to that. But there's a day coming, there's a reckoning coming um, that, that the world is going to face. And right now, we have a message that can not just save people from the wrath to come, but that can transform lives here and now. I mean, do you believe that the gospel can trans not only save you from God's judgment of wrath, but it can also transform your life? I mean, has anybody here not been transformed from here they who they were before? I mean, I know I have. And so it's not just from that. It's also saving themselves from you know, the things that are going on in this world and the mistakes that they're making in this world. And so I don't even think that we fully uh, recognize all the ramifications that are that are in play with this situation so um, that's just a little bit of a reminder any comments before we get started thoughts anybody want to share their uh, difficulties that they have with uh, evangelizing i think it's harder to to share the gospel with people you've known for a long time that you haven't shared it with before mm -hmm. Because you almost, I, in my mind, I hear him saying, well, why didn't you tell me this before? <laughs> you know, and then I don't have a good answer. Yeah. You know, no good answer. 
No, and you just tell them, I've got no good answer, but I'm sharing it with you now. <laughs> it's about the only thing you can really say, I guess, but you're right. And I think that there's a lot of reasons why we have trouble sharing it uh, with particular groups. You know, sometimes we have a lot of trouble sharing it with our family members or those who we work with or those who we know because, you know, what if they say something and I don't have an answer to? I'm just going to look like an idiot. I'm going to look stupid. Now, I don't think Paul ever had that problem, not having an answer. Um, but he talks about, and if we get to it, we'll look at the verse today, where he talks about that he was a fool for Christ. He was willing to be made a fool for it. And, and the fact that we need to be willing to do that. Because if they do believe, and they, that person does believe, whether it's that day or whether it's 20 years from now, they become a believer and they're saved. The fact of the matter is, is anybody who, uh, who does believe, they're going to be thankful for the fact that you share, shared it with them. Um, it's, it's going to be a, 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 a moment of appreciation. And it's important, uh, or I shouldn't say important, to me it's, it's interesting how little we talk to even one another about how and when we became believers. And how, how that can be such an encouraging story. And so through this, if, if anyone here uh, wants to share, if somebody's listening online and they want to email, email me or, or share it within the YouTube or the Facebook or whatever, and you want to share your how you became a believer, when you heard the gospel and how you became a believer, I think, uh, I think that'd be important. We can use the time to do that in this study. And I would encourage you to be willing to do it. And uh, Tim, um, I have a, a really good uh, Christian uh, friend who's an attorney. Hi. Uh, Sorry, yeah. It's so, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you guys be, uh, late. <laughs> hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hi. Go ahead. Okay. And so after. Um, you know, I sent him the, the blog that I wrote. Mm -hmm. Which is on the website. If you haven't read Tim's, that's the same one you're talking about, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, I was kind of sort of patting myself on the back uh, and talking to him. And he had a, an interesting comment to that. Uh, so Tim, I just want you to, to think about one thing, though. Uh, and he raises orphans, so... He has uh, uh, kids at home and said, you know, I, I give them chores to do and, and one of them is, you know, vacuuming and, uh, and that. And, and I came home after uh, I told them what the vacuum and everything and he, he said, you know what, Dad? I researched and I learned everything about vacuums. I can tell you how that works. I can, uh, you know, tell you I can take that bag off in in two okay. seconds, and um, you know. But did you vacuum the floors today? Uh, well, no, I, I didn't quite have time uh, to do that. Maybe I'll get to that tomorrow. <laughs> so, but his point is that you know we can uh, have great knowledge and debates, but if we aren't actually doing what um, God has instructed us to do, then we're, we're really not uh, mm -hmm. fulfilling uh, the mission. That's exactly right. Yeah. And we need to be about doing that because like I said, that's it's really the reason why we're still here. Keep in mind Christ, once he saved you, he could have taken you to glory at that point, but he didn't. So, and I think sometimes rightly divided because we are in so much of the minority I think we spend so much time, you know, defending our position mm -hmm. with other believers that sometimes, uh, you know, the, the unbelieving, the people who aren't saved, uh, kind of get put into a secondary role. And, and this goes back to a conversation I was having recently, and I've shared it with you guys before in the past, how, how much uh, pride is in the, the hearts and the minds of most believers. Because the reason we often do that, oftentimes, not always, we are to defend the doctrine, we are to stand up for that, there's no doubt about that. 
but oftentimes it's really more of a result of our own pride of why we're doing it because again we need to be willing to let the people think we're wrong you know one of the things that i make it a point to do if i'm on on facebook and i'm discussing with people i'm not going to get into a point where i'm rude with somebody they can be rude all they want they can be mean-spirited they can be all of this but i'm not going to go there i'll just shut up and be quiet and, and the, the whole world can think i lost that argument i don't care because because I'm not, I'm not going to present that case before. I'm not so worried about looking right that I'm going to do wrong. That's not, that's not as near as important to me. You know, we got to be more. It's got to be more important for us to do right than to be viewed as right. And so, uh, Tim, I think you're exactly right. We need to be uh, remembering our uh, and placing enough emphasis on the gospel that work that we need to be doing being ministers of the word of reconciliation being ambassadors all these things that we'll talk about today so good good comments so and so uh, as far as again testimonies on how you got saved how you uh, heard the gospel you may have heard the gospel 20 times and then finally where when you finally believed it feel free to share that i would encourage you to share that i will share that myself uh, there's no problem with that and uh, as we go along here so any other comments or okay all right so again evangelism um, what is it we talked about last week that we're trying to ultimately I think that evangelism can also lead into equipping the Saints we're trying to always encounter the world both unbelievers and believers with Jesus Christ and we're always trying to, we realize that we're always having an effect on somebody. Uh, every time we interact with somebody, we're going to have an effect with them. And we always, want to, we always want to be about introducing Jesus back into the situation, whether it's believers and specifically with unbelievers. And so when we talk about evangelism, typically we're talking about the, uh, the lost, and, and that's really the, the focus of it. And so we want to introduce uh, Jesus into the into the equation and the mind and the thinking of the lost, the unsaved. And so with that is, is going to be a number of things. If you haven't already listened to it, uh, I would remind you that there are times when you can believe in Jesus and you're not going to be saved. There's many people that believe in Jesus and they're not saved. Uh, and if you don't know what I mean, there's a message on our website. Uh, it's when believing in Jesus won't save you. Uh, and so keep in mind, it's not just that you believe in Jesus, it's what you believe about Jesus that, that is the salvation message. And if there's any questions on that, we'll obviously work on that that statement as we go, as as we start detailing it, is, you know, what is the gospel and how is it that we actually share the gospel strategies? Because that's one of the things I want us to make sure we get to. It's not just this, you know, superficial study of theoretical ideas but really get into nuts and bolts of uh, how is it that we can do it so that you can feel encouraged on a, a really concrete way having that that notion in mind again there are people who are blessed with the gift of introducing I mean I, I mentioned to you before Steve who comes here uh, and Steve, if you're watching, I'm giving you trouble because you're not here today. So, but Steve is very good at sharing the gospel. He's got it written all over his truck, matter of fact. And so there are certain people that are very comfortable in their skin with doing that. And so other people can learn and be encouraged on, oftentimes it's how to take that first step. How is it that you take that first step? And why tracks are a, a good ministry to him and so maybe one of these one of the one of these times here we'll get whitey to tell us stories how he used to do it whenever he was a missionary matter of fact your book up there that book that you wrote yep. do you discuss that quite a bit on on the times in which you 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 get to um, share the gospel with new people in these foreign lands yeah and so if you haven't read whitey's book what's the name of it i forgot What's the name of the book? I forgot. Merrill Chone. I can't even say that, even if he didn't have a cookie in his mouth. <laughs> so, 
Marichone. Marichone. It's Mar the name of the place. Name of the place. Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't read that, that book's back there. I, I would encourage you to read that, uh, coming from a former missionary here. Mike was a missionary, Mike and Sharon, so, so they've done that work before. And so there, there are people who, are, who have been, and that's what equipping the saints is about, is, hey, you've done it, I've never done it, and so tell me how to do it, that kind of a thing. But if we don't have that conversation and we don't actually get into real, concrete examples of how to do it, then uh, it's still going to be difficult for some of us to do. So, all right, let's get into some more, let's get into the Word of God, I guess. Last week, I think we ended in Acts chapter 20, uh, 21 and Acts chapter 8, looking at the word evangelist. We looked at Acts chapter 8 where we have um, this, this description of Philip. Remember uh, in Acts chapter 21 what we saw was uh, Luke who wrote the book of Acts talking about how they, meaning him and Paul and Paul's crowd, went into Caesarea, a coastal region in Israel, into the house of one Philip the evangelist. And so we looked at, well, why is he called the evangelist? Well, because obviously he was going around and he was sharing Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of our example. Well, keep in mind, in Scripture today, um, we also have another example. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 16. Here we have this statement that Paul says. He says, Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Now that can encompass a lot of things. Um, certainly doctrine, but also the work in which Paul does. Does Paul say, you know what, I'm an apostle, I'm too important, you guys take care of the, um, sharing the gospel. I'm going to go around and, and establish churches, I'm going to go around and, and, and pick who's going to be in charge. Or does he get his feet in the dirt, in the muck? Does he make himself look like a fool? Does he go around to the unbeliever who is going to mock him? Does he go around to the Jew who's going to despise him? Yes, he does. And so this verse here, being a follower of Paul, uh, is, is a direct statement to the body of Christ that, that the, the things that he's out there doing, we need to be doing too. It's not, it's not just for the pastor. It's not just for somebody who's been ordained. It's not just for somebody who says, you know, well, I don't want to do that. I want to, you know, do this other work. You know, I want to bring in cookies, or I want to vacuum the floors, or I want to, you know, be the janitor, or I want to... No. No one's not important enough, and no one is too important to not um, share the gospel. That's the example that we have. So being a follower of Paul is one of those things that we need to, we need to be willing, and we need to understand that Paul's ministry was about doing that. Constantly was he doing that. Look over in chapter 11 here, verse 1, the first Corinthians, first Corinthians 11, verse 1. Here Paul again says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. In other words, we follow Paul as Paul follows Christ, not in the sense that, well, whenever he happens to be doing it the right way. No, the point is, is that... Uh, Christ gave this authority to the Apostle Paul, and Paul followed Christ. And because Christ gave this authority as an Apostle uh, to Paul, uh, we too need to follow in, get in line, follow lock, step, and barrel, and do the same thing. Because as we're following Paul, guess who you're following? Christ. Christ. Tim. Uh, the New King James Version uses the word imitate. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's even stronger than follow me, mm -hmm. because follow me, you can follow without being uh, happy and, and doing it, but if you imitate, it's almost impossible to be passive, and you have to mm -hmm. be active. It's a good point, because the Greek word there is mimetes, and we get our word mimic from it. And so it's literally, whenever you think of, you know, somebody who 
mimics somebody. Um, I did a, a message not that while longer back about be a copycat. Well, that means you need to co- be a copycat of the Apostle Paul. You need to you need to mimic the things that he does. Um, again, not because he's more important in Christ, and not because you know you shouldn't mimic Christ, but what the scripture is telling you is in order for you to to mimic and do what Christ wants you to do here's your example on how and what to do keep in mind Paul's not boasting in himself when he says this this is God's word saying this this is God saying to do this Uh, and so we need to keep that in mind turn to Acts chapter 26 which if you recall is one of the three occasions which we have Paul's salvation experience and so if we understand that we need to do the same things that uh, that the apostle the Gentiles um, has been doing or does do notice he's immediately given certain instructions again you compare Acts 9 to Acts 22 and then Acts 26 and you get the complete revelation of Paul's salvation experience but it's interesting what we have here. Look in uh, 2 Corinthians 20, I'm sorry, Acts 26, starting in verse 16. Here we have his description of what took place and his conversation with Jesus. Now we'll just start in verse 15. And I said, that's Paul speaking, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things, these things being what you're seeing right this very minute, me appearing to you, you thought I was dead, you thought I was put in the tomb, you thought they stole my body, when in fact, guess what, Paul? I'm standing here before you. So he's a witness of that and this road to Damascus experience, and the things which I'm going to show you, which I will appear unto thee, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you. So now Paul is giving his commission, which if Paul was, as we're doing our message on stewards of the mysteries, if he was a steward of the mysteries, that makes you what? Steward of the mysteries. Steward of the mysteries. If he's a minister of the word of reconciliation, what does that make you? And if he was now sent, now you don't have the authority of apostle, so don't get don't 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 get confused there. Paul had the authority of apostle. That was a special designation. When you see somebody on out there calling themselves apostle this or whatever, um, don't don't think that it works that way. There are no apostles today, and so. Uh, but just like he was sent, we too are now sent to do what? Well, what does it say? To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So that sounds an awful lot like to go preach the gospel, doesn't it? And it sounds an awful lot like that. Because how else are you going to turn somebody from darkness to light? It's not going to be by, you know, discussing theology. There's only one way to be turned from darkness to light, and it's the gospel. Yeah, and we're going to look at some of those verses here in a minute. But that's exactly right. George is exactly right. It is. It is. You have to, in order for somebody to uh, go from darkness to light, to go from being um, a child of Satan, which I know that's a strong word, but that's what the scriptures describe the unbeliever as, uh, it, it, to go from a child of Satan to the child of God, it's only through the gospel. It's not from, and I think it was Wendy who brought this up last week, that you know, it's not from we get into this discussion about God in our hearts. Yes, Christ in you is the hope of glory. There is no doubt about that. But how does he get there? How is it that you receive this forgiveness of sins? Is it because you believe in Jesus? Well, what do you believe in Jesus? And so these are the things that we have to understand because if we're going to go out and share the gospel, 
um, we better make sure that we have the right gospel. Because if we have the wrong one, then, then it's really bad because people will think that they're sick. You know, there's only, there's only one gospel that saves today. And so we have to make sure that we understand that. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. Continue this understanding of the fact that, yes, you, each and every single one of us, are called to do this. You don't, it's not like, again, I keep driving this point home, but it really, because it needs to be made understood. It's not some people who are supposed to be doing this. It's not just the people who are good at doing this who are supposed to do this. It's all of us. 2 Corinthians 5. You might remember that this here is where you get your commission. This is where you get, as the body of Christ, this is your commission. You know, I, they talk about the idea of, you know, somebody who commissions somebody for a painting. You know, they're basically, they're assigned and they've been given this responsibility. Well, here's your commission. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 11. And we're going to come back to this verse 11 later because of how important it is. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that we may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause to judge, basically. For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live... Notice this next part. How many Christians fail to apply this part? For the love of Christ constrained us, uh, I'm sorry, verse 15, and he that died for all, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We have to be willing to realize that it's no longer our lives. It's not. I mean, we still think in a worldly, ter worldly terms, and we're all guilty of this. If you honestly think that you're not guilty of doing this, feel free to raise your hand. <laughs> I'm guilty of this. We all are. <clears throat> but every day we pick up our cross and we try to, we try to get past this. Go ahead. Isn't it true here? I mean, this is just kind of a point in rightly dividing, but um, actually, I guess we haven't read the verse yet. I don't know if you're going on to it, but. Um, we don't know Christ after the flesh. I mean, and that's kind of the point he's making. You know, the death, burial, and resurrection, we know him as the risen Lord. We didn't know him here in his earthly ministry in the flesh. And I think there's so many people that, um, in other denominations, I mean, that's kind of the big mistake of the gospel that that is being shared, you know? And I think it's important that... Yeah, and I think that we can talk about that more once we get into the specific gospel and comparing you know the warnings that we have about um you know the fact that we don't know jesus after the flesh meaning his fleshly ministry in other words that's not that's not how we are to follow follow jesus but we're to follow him based upon the revelation of the mystery and so i think we, we can talk about that more then because i think that's that's very important but for here what we're trying to see here is is as we continue to go on is that we don't belong to ourselves and this comes into the fact that we're ambassadors, that we're ministers, that we're stewards, that we've been bought with a price, that we have a commission. I mean, these are all different verses that are all over the place. But yet, it's, isn't it interesting how Christians seem to think that, that you, know, um, you know, what's that old song? I, I, I'm trying to remember what the name of it is or what the song is, is that I did it my way, that... That it, it's my life. I think it's a Bon Jovi song. It's my life is the name of it. Um, well, as a Christian, guess what you don't get to say? 
It's my life. Because guess what? It ain't your life anymore. And that's what Scripture's telling us. It's not our, it's not our life. And sometimes that may be intimidating. We may not like it. But trust me, once you truly comprehend it, you be glad. Because God's wisdom is greater than our wisdom. We may want to hold on to our life, but that really always leads to problems. It's whenever we do it His way that it ends up working out. But anyway, let's go on. Um, yeah, in verse, and, and this gets into verse 16, which Val wrote or, or mentioned, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. And you realize as a member of the body of Christ, you're part of something brand new. Probably the greatest creation of, of God. We have, you know, there's the old, old saying that God created Adam and he saved the best for last and he made who? Eve. Actually, the best for last was what? The new creation, the new creation the body of Christ. The that's the greatest creation. And it is a new creation. And it is a true creation. Um, and in verse 18, All things are of God who hath reconciled us, us is the believers, to himself by Jesus Christ. And here we go. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. See, don't ever call me a minister. Uh, and it, because if you were to call me a minister, then you better call yourself one too, because we're all ministers. I'm not a minister in the sense of the way the world uses it. I'm a minister of the word of reconciliation, but so are you. To wit, what is that? What's this talking about? The ministry of reconciliation. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. This here is your commission. Don't, don't go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for your commission. Go here. This is where it is your commission. And what is the commission? To go around and share through your ministry of the word of reconciliation that God has created this new creature called the body of Christ and he has reconciled the world unto himself and that you can have that reconciliation as Ephesians 1 talks about you can have that peace verse uh, 20 now then in other words what's this mean it means that okay because of all that we just said now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ that be you reconciled to God. For he made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. One of my favorite verses right there, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. One of my favorite, favorite verses. And so here we have, again, this, um, this instruction that it is to each of us. We all have this ministry. Look at... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Here we have in verse 14, uh, again, the last book that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote. He's writing it to Timothy, who is at uh, Ephesus as the as the pastor and he makes this statement he says that good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in us and so here's this instruction of to to Timothy to to that that good thing that was committed unto thee well let me ask you a question what was committed unto you to you guys what was committed unto you the word of reconciliation. Now, obviously, there's more instruction that he gives in, in this book about holding fast to, to sound doctrine and all these kind of things. But the fact of the matter is, is, is that the, the thing that, that is really committed unto us is, is our responsibility uh, is, is in sharing the gospel. That's, that's what's important. 
And then I would also take you back to Ephesians, go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. Here Paul is, if you're familiar with the chapter 6, um, it's the armor of God um, chapter. And uh, here at the end of this chapter, he even asks for prayer for himself. You know, this man who, who could raise the dead, this man who could speak boldly, this man who, um, who, 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 again, who could heal the sick and do all speak in tongues, who says, I have all knowledge, I have prophecy, I have all these things. But notice what he does at the end of, of this chapter. Notice what he says. He says, verse, starting verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me. In other words, pray for me. What? That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And again, take that as instruction for yourself, that we ought, for one, to, to request prayer. Two, be praying, you know, also ourselves for that situation, and praying for what? That you would speak boldly as you what? Ought to speak. And so we ought to speak. It's, 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 our, it's our mandate, it really comes down to. And so... The other thing is, as we have to remember, is that um, Paul also warns about the... There are those at this time who, who want to share Christ, and they want to share Christ because of um, selfish gain. You know, have you ever seen those people on television? I'm not going to name names. Don't tip me. Uh, mind. Uh, but they seem like, boy, they're sure getting awful wealthy using the name of Jesus Christ. And I've got nothing against wealth. Uh, trust me, I've got nothing, nothing against that. If somebody wants to give me a million dollars, I'll take it. I mean, I'll probably give most of it away, but the fact of the matter is, is but, 